Welcome back to the conference, everyone. Um, and welcome to our final event of, of day three, uh, the Sound ID Challenge offered by Nathan Peeplo. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Nathan. Many of you took his uh, workshop, a shared vocabulary for bird sound ID on Thursday. And I also am sure that many of us have taken this workshop in previous years of the WFO conference. Uh, Nathan is well known as the author of the Peterson Guide to Bird Sounds of North America, offered in a Western and Eastern edition. Uh, I have to say that my first use of the Western edition was to take it to my audiologist and show him the, sonic, the spectrogram of the Golden Crown Kinglet, uh, which allowed me to convince him that it actually was worthwhile to hear sounds over eight kilohertz. So um, thank you for that, Nathan. Uh, I've now removed that from my personal endangered species list. Um, Nathan teaches writing and rhetoric at the University of Colorado Boulder. And he also has created an ear birding blog that is really informative and well worth visiting. So I will not take any further time and turn it over to Nathan for the Sound ID Challenge. Thank you so much, John. Welcome everybody to our Sound ID Challenge for 2021. This year, it's going to be very different from previous years. Uh, we have a totally new format. And so we're going to, uh, because we're on Zoom uh, and that gives us new limitations and also new possibilities, we're just gonna do something totally different than what we've done the last few years. So, this year, there are not going to be any teams. And this year, there are not going to be any points. I'm going to play you some sounds. And for each sound that I play, I may give you some more information, I may not. But after I play the sound, our events coordinator, Jen Hodge, is going to pop up a poll on your screen, a Zoom poll, and you will have a multiple choice set of answers to choose from. So all of our questions tonight are gonna to be multiple choice. Usually there will be four birds to choose from. And your answers are going to be completely anonymous. Nobody will know whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong. All they'll be able to see is how many people answered each type of bird. Uh, so, We'll start right now with a little bit of a test run. Uh, Jen, if you can run the test poll for everybody so that they can see what this is gonna look like. Sure. Do you want the sound before the poll or do you want it after the poll is visible? Uh, well, either one is fine. Uh, when, when we get running, I'll probably uh, play the sound uh, and basically, Almost as soon as the sound gets played, you can pop that pull up. Okay, here's the sound. Kaka! This is just a test, just so you can see how the polls work. So you just heard the the first test sound from Jen, uh, and you can tell which of those four species you think she might have been imitating. For each of these polls, we'll keep it up for a couple of, uh, for, for a short time, usually for about 60 seconds, we'll, we'll keep this poll up. Uh, if you don't have any clue and you don't want to participate, all you have to do is just not choose one of the options. Uh, after about six, 60 seconds, the, the poll will close and then you will see the, the, the bar chart of the results. So if you wish to choose, go ahead and, and choose one of those four birds. And now we will close that poll and we will see what people thought. And we can see that those species were pretty evenly split, but most people thought that that cacao was from an ivory-billed woodpecker. 
Uh, I don't know what I would have chosen, maybe Carolina parakeet, uh, possibly Labrador duck. Uh, but this one was, as you can see, just for fun. This is how we're going to do our polls today. Uh, so after we, after I play each sound, I'm gonna ask the audience to choose one of the options on the poll. Then we're gonna see what everybody chose. And then we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking about why people chose what they chose. Uh, and, and as part of that, I will at some point share the correct answer. Um, so after you have entered your potential answer on your poll, if you would like to talk about why you chose that, you can feel free to type something in the chat if you like. And when you type in the chat, you, you, in order to do this, you can find the little chat button at either the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen. You might have to, to mouse over either the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen in order to find it. There's a little button that says chat there. And when you pop up the chat window, you'll be able to see what other people have put in the chat. You can choose whether to send your answer just to the host and panelists or whether to send it to everyone. Uh, if you send it to everyone, uh, then I may call on you later on uh, to ask you to talk about your answer and talk about why you chose what you chose. Uh, so if you're willing to be interviewed potentially or to share with the entire group, then make sure to send your chat to everyone. Uh, and if you'd rather just keep it private, send it to host and panelists, and then I won't call on you out loud. Uh, and you may have noticed that you don't have uh, audio capability right now, but if I do call on you, then uh, Jen can actually unmute you or, or allow you to unmute yourself so you can share with this. So after each question, we'll just have a couple minutes of discussion. Uh, and as you know, if you have seen my presentations before, I like to be interactive. I don't wanna be the only one talking. I wanna get everybody talking. So that's why I'm asking you to share if you would like to, uh, what you would like to do. Now, we're going to do a little bit of experimentation. Uh, I should say, before we get started, normally I ask you at this point to put away all of your electronic devices and not use any cell phones or anything like that during this talk. Obviously you are attending this talk on a, on a device. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna open it wide open this year. Uh, so this year, feel free to use whatever you wanna use in order to uh, talk about, in order to figure out the answer to your uh, bird sound quizzes this year. That includes, Merlin Sound ID, this nifty little uh, app that just recently came out from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you want to use this during the uh, session today, you can feel free to do that and we can talk about the results that you get. I'll, I'll warn you that I have tested the 10 sounds tonight on Merlin Sound ID uh, and Merlin didn't do super great It'll get some of them right. Uh, it won't get them all right. So we can talk about, we can use this opportunity to talk about uh, the limits of that, uh, that app. Uh, you can feel free to use the Peterson Field Guide to Bird Sounds, of course. Uh, the more useful one today will be the Western uh, edition. Uh, you can feel free to use the website the Peterson Field Guide to Bird Sounds website. PetersonBirdSounds.com will redirect you here. Uh, if you want to listen to the species and compare, you can do that. You won't have a whole lot of time to do that because we'll be moving at a fairly fast clip. Uh, you can also use you know, Canto, you can use eBird, you can use whatever you want. You can use any of the other apps that purport to ID sounds. Let's put all of our brains and abilities together and see if they can help us identify these sounds today. So what I'm gonna ask you to do first, I'm gonna play you another test sound just to make sure 
that everybody is able to hear what I'm going to share. Uh, so what I'd like you to do real quick is listen to this. Oh, I think I need to stop my. There you go. Stop my screen share and do the whole share sound thing again. Let me try it again. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play you a test sound and I wanna see if it works for you. This is not one of our quiz birds uh, today. This is just to see if you can uh, adjust your audio level and see if this works. That was an angry will it. If that came in loud and clear, please drop me a note in the chat to that effect. If you had any difficulty in hearing that, let me know and we will figure out a different way to, to go. All right, looks like I'm seeing positive responses, which is great, which means that my setup is going to work. All right then let's get going on our actual quiz sounds for the evening. Here is our first bird of the night. So I'm gonna play it. And then as soon as it ends, I'm gonna ask Jen to put up the four answers, uh, the, the poll, and then I'll play it a couple more times while the poll is open. And you can uh, choose what you want to do. Uh, you can spend some time listening. You can choose an option. Uh, and the, the, the poll will be open for roughly 60 to 90 seconds or so. So here's the first time hearing it. And as soon as it's over, uh, we can and open up the poll. That's it. I'll just play this a few times while you decide which of those options you like. And I'll play it about one more time here. All right, if you haven't yet answered that question and you would like to, then make sure to put your answer on, choose your multiple choice answer from that poll window that should have popped up. <clears throat> And now I'm going to ask Jen to close that poll and share our results. And look at that. So now you should be able to see the results. And it looks like uh, we have almost an even split between all four options on that, uh, that sound. It's a tricky sound that I share. Uh, it's one bird singing the same note over and over again. Chipping Sparrow seems to have edged out. Uh, Orange Crown Warbler, which is the second most popular choice, followed by Dark Eyed Junko and Canyon Toey, but four votes separate the first place bird from the last place bird. So clearly this is an interesting sound quiz question. Uh, if you have an answer as to why you chose the bird you chose, uh, go ahead and type it in the chat. And like I said before, if you wanna just hit that little drop down, you can either uh, send your chat to host and panelists, meaning I will 
you are not eligible to be called upon, or you can send it to everyone, in which case uh, you might get called upon to talk about why you thought it was what you thought it was. And along the way, maybe we'll find out what Merlin thought. Maybe we'll find out what some of the other apps thought. Why did you choose Chipping Sparrow, Dark Eyed Junko, Canyon Toey, or Orange Crown Warbler? And by the way, because your answers are completely anonymous, uh, if, you, if you don't mention which bird you picked in your answer, then uh, we're not going to know. So for example, what did, Ted, what did Merlin tell you? <laughs> I've unmuted Ted if um, he would like to share. Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not hearing from Ted. I'm not sure if he's. Uh... Oh, he's he's unmuted now. Ted, if you'd like to share. You may not want to. That's fine. Totally fine. Uh, or I figured it might be technical difficulties. Um, that's all right. So we've got a we've got a whole bunch of answers here, and there and and I'm seeing a lot of very very interesting uh, reasoning, right? Um, so for example, Kimball Garrett says, uh, "Slower and more musical than what I would expect from Chipping Sparrow." I'm I'm seeing that in a lot of responses here. Uh, a lot of people are saying, I would expect orange crowned warbler to change pitch more than this bird does. Uh, it seems too slow for chipping sparrow. This is, a, this is a, a, a response I'm getting from several people. Some people, uh, like, like I liked John's uh, answer. He said, uh, I picked canyon toy because I'm not familiar with it. And this is actually a very useful way for those of us who have achieved a certain level of bird sound recognition to choose a species, right? If, if the bird sounds unfamiliar, we might assign the, the, the option that seems uh, less familiar. I do it all the time. It's, it's actually a, 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 a reasonable and, and good uh, heuristic. Um, now, BirdNet apparently uh, called this a chipping sparrow. Merlin called this a chipping sparrow. Uh, and one of the reasons that that might be is because this was a chipping sparrow that made this sound. Uh, this particular chipping sparrow was one that I recorded in Michigan. Uh, this is a very slow and musical chipping sparrow, much slower and more musical than most chipping sparrows. However, there are a number of chipping sparrows like this out there. Uh, so I'm going to take you right now. I think you're you're seeing this on my screen, right? You're seeing the Chipping Sparrow uh, page on the uh, Peterson Bird Sounds website. Uh, note this one here. This one's from Ontario, and this is almost the exact same song that I recorded in Michigan. Remarkably slow and musical for a Chipping Sparrow. But there are birds like this all over the range of chipping sparrow. I've recorded this in Michigan. I recorded a similar bird in Mexico singing like this, almost the exact same song type. And then this one was uh, from Ontario in 1958. Notice that typically we're going to expect something like this for chipping sparrow. 
something much faster. And note the shape of those notes on the spectrogram. Very simple, up and down, kind of buzzy. Uh, and, and it's just really, really fast. And that's what creates that unmusical insect-like quality that most of us expect from Chipping Sparrow. Uh, this is going to suggest something very different because it's so slow. Uh, and yet, uh, this one is a Chipping Sparrow too. Now, if we go to check out Dark Eyed Junko, take a second here. I will give you a hint right now. Uh, people sometimes ask me when we're out in the field, I'm hearing a trilled song, is that a chipping sparrow or a junco? My default answer, if I cannot see the spectrogram, is to say, let's go take a look at that bird. Because I have been fooled too many times by juncos and chipping sparrows in the field, both directions, uh, to, to be confident calling them by ear. In particular, if you hear a slow and musical chipping sparrow that sounds more like a junco, it may well be a chipping sparrow. Uh, you'll notice that when we actually look at the spectrogram of a dark eyed junco song, we see typically something much more complex uh, than what you see in a typical chipping sparrow. So a lot of different kinds of shapes going on here. That's typical of a junco. And usually there's at least some of these little horizontal lines that create that musical quality like this. So what I like to do if I'm hearing a triller out there is I like to get Song Sleuth or BirdNet or one of these other apps on my phone that will actually generate the spectrogram of the bird I'm hearing in real time uh, because the spectrogram shape of the notes really helps uh, in distinguishing borderline cases of Junko from Chipping Sparrow. Uh, I'll just, we briefly mentioned the other two, orange crown warbler. Some, some people seemed to hear changes in pitch in the mystery bird, but the mystery bird really did not change in pitch. Uh, certainly not to the extent that orange crown warbler typically does. Here's a, here's a typical orange crown warbler. And notice you can actually see on the spectrogram how not all of those notes are exactly the same and they kind of go up and down a little bit. This one's even less changing than most orange crowns. Well, that one was significantly down at the end. And these kind of chevron shapes, these check mark shapes, uh, on the on the notes are typical of warblers in general and orange crown in particular. Uh, and you'll often get something more crazy from orange crown warbler. And then finally, just to mention canyon toey, which is a uh, one of those birds that flies under the radar for a lot of us. Uh, if you don't live where canyon toeys live, you can get thrown off by them when you do show up near them. Here's a fairly trilling canyon toe. Not too far off from our quiz bird, by ear anyway. But this is quite a bit lower pitched than any chipping sparrow uh, or than our quiz bird. So I'll play our quiz bird one more time just for comparison. And we'll compare that with our canyon toey which is much lower pitched. And Canyon Toey is never gonna be insect-like, buzzy, uh, or really, really fast. And in fact, it's almost never a trill. It's always, always a series. You can almost always count the individual notes. Uh, this is one of the more borderline cases, but it's not even that borderline since it's so slow, so low, and so musical. All right, so you get the idea. 
of what we're going to do tonight. Uh, I have 10 of these lined up. We may or may not get through them all. We'll see. We'll try to kind of keep it to an hour roughly. Uh, and we'll maybe spend not quite as long on each of them. But uh, here comes quiz bird number two. So I'm going to play this. It's about a 30 second clip. And after I'm done playing it, I'm going to ask Jen to pop up the poll, and then I'll play it again. So this is one of our robin-like singers, black-headed grosbeak, American robin, summer tanager, hepatic tanager. These are your four choices. I will play this twice more while you think about it or engage your resources. And one more time through. So of course there is a Western wood peewee in the background. There's also a morning dove in the background. Uh, Merlin can hear the Western wood peewee. It pops that right up, but that is not our target bird. The target bird is the robin-like singer in the, in the foreground. Uh, so you'll notice, I think it seems to me from what I'm seeing in the chat and this, uh, this lines up with my experience on this particular uh, track the other day, if Merlin doesn't recognize a bird sound, it simply does not say anything. It simply, you know, if it, if it recognizes something in the background, it'll pop that bird's name up. Uh, if it does not recognize the foreground bird, it will simply remain silent on the issue of what that bird actually is. Uh, so let's see what we've got from our, our answers. Ooh. I know I picked a good quiz question if I'm splitting people almost in quarters in terms of the audience. Uh, I see that the fewest number of people chose American Robin. And that probably makes sense because most of us are probably most familiar with Robin. Robin is our touchstone. It's our comparison species. Uh, and you may have noticed that this bird doesn't quite sound like a Robin. It, it sounds like a Robin, but uh, it doesn't sound quite right for Robin. Uh, and there are a couple reasons for that. Uh, it sounds a little bit low, a little bit musical, and it's got a little bit of a herky-jerky rhythm, which Robin typically doesn't. Robin is, Robin's phrases are typically very strict in rhythm. Cheery up, cheery up, cheery up, cheery, cheery. And then Robin's often, not always, have these high-pitched polyphonic complex phrases that pop in at the end of, after four or five or six 
uh, of what we call the caroling phrases. Uh, these high-pitched hissily phrases that sound more specifically thrush-like, more distinctively thrush-like. Just because you're not hearing them doesn't mean it's not a robin because robins don't always use them. If you do hear them, you can go straight to robin and, and eliminate all tanagers and all gross beaks. We did not hear those high-pitched complex thrush-like phrases at the ends of these song types. Um, so I'm seeing all sorts of stuff. Birdnet apparently is all over the place. Uh, it says Western Tanager, which wasn't even one of the options. It says Black Headed Grosbeak. Uh, Merlin apparently, so, a lot of people didn't get a response from Merlin. Some people got Merlin to say American Robin. Notice one thing about Merlin that I've noticed is that Merlin automatically uh, takes what it's hearing and compares it to the bird list that's expected in your location where your phone is right now. And I don't know of a way to change that. I don't know of a way to say to Merlin, hey, this was recorded in Colorado in August. Um, it's just gonna assume that wherever you are, whenever you are, <clears throat> you're listening to a bird in the field. It's not set up for this kind of quiz. So you might get different answers. Uh, it might be ruling out like summer or hepatic tanagers because it doesn't expect them to be in your area. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're, when you're using Merlin, especially when you're using it uh, on this type of quiz, which Merlin was not built for. So uh, let's see. Uh, the number one choice here was black-headed grosbeak and the number two choice was hepatic tanager. And Kimball said uh, that he chose hepatic tanager because he hears the other three species regularly and this song didn't match. So it, he thought it probably uh, sounded best for hepatic. Uh, uh, Barbara had similar, uh, similar reasoning. And that, is, that, that has led them to the correct answer. This is a hepatic tanager singing. Um, and so it sounds to me, uh, like if I, if I were to hear this in the field, my first thought would be black headed grosbeak. Uh, as John notes, black, uh, hepatic tanager and black headed grosbeak sound very similar. And when I first heard th this, actually, this, this recording is of the first hepatic tanager I ever heard singing. Uh, this was a bird that was singing in Colorado in 2005 at a site where they have bred basically ever since. Uh, it's, a, it's a known location. And black-headed grosbeaks and hepatic tangers sing side by side at this location as they do almost throughout their range or, or almost throughout the range of hepatic tanager. Um, so it's very difficult to tell a hepatic tanager from a black-headed grosbeak. And actually summer tanager is kind of similar to both. Um, Summer tanager has a little bit of a different rhythm. I, I, rhythm is one of those things that a lot of people don't mention uh, when they're talking about how to tell tanagers from robins, from, uh, from grosbeaks. But I think, I think rhythm is one of our, our best friends because uh, Western tanager and Scarlet tanager and American robin, they, they sing in this very strict rhythm. Whereas black-headed grosbeak has this very herky-jerky rhythm because the notes are not all the same length. And so they don't start uh, equal distances apart in time. Um, same goes for summer and hepatic tanagers with hepatic tanager being a little bit less herky-jerky than black-headed grosbeak. Uh, and uh, Barbara just notes that, that it, this lacks kind of the trills that you, are, you might hear in black-headed grosbeak. You might hear these kind of long slurred notes in black-headed grosbeak. Black-headed grosbeak famously is, is, is uh, described as a robin who has had voice lessons. And so you'll hear more flourishes in a black-headed grosbeak. This is more just straight up uh, simple phrases. I'll play it again for you here. You hear that herky-jerky rhythm. Okay. 
that was just half the half the sound there. It's got that herky jerky rhythm and that musical quality that we associate with Black Headed Grosbeak, uh, but it's lacking a little bit of the variety, and it's quite a bit slower uh, than you would expect for from a Black Headed Grosbeak. Not that Black Headed Grosbeak couldn't sing this slow, but they usually don't, and they often accelerate as they go through their their long phrases. Uh, so this. What you hear in summer tanager is usually those kind of paired phrases uh, where there's two phrases right together and then a little bit longer pause and then two or three right together and then a little bit longer pause. Uh, so that's a different rhythm than you hear from any other tanager. So that, this, this is a tricky one, uh, but that is why I would call this uh, a, black, a, a hepatic tanager if I heard it. Let's go on to quiz bird number three. Oh no, it's a gull. One of my great goals in life is to get people actually listening to gulls instead of just looking at their wingtips. I wish they all could be California gulls. I'll play this a couple more times. You should finalize your answer there on the, uh, on the poll. And if you have a reason why, feel free to share it in the chat and we can discuss. Claire says in the chat, I wish they would all hybridize and we could just call them seagulls. Claire, your wish is granted. They do all hybridize and people do just call them seagulls. One more time. All right, let's see what people said. Very interesting. So despite our wish that they could all be California gulls, very few people actually chose California gull. That one seems to have gotten significantly fewer answers than the other three. Franklin's gull coming in in first place, followed by herring gull, followed by ring build with California a distant fourth. So why did we think this was what well, why did you think it was what you thought it was? If you have an answer to that, I'd like to see it. I'd like to know what your reasoning was. I'd also like to know what, if anything, the apps said. <laughs> uh, I, get a, I got a response from Eve saying that BirdNet in San Diego said this was a loggerhead shrike. <laughs> So, you know, uh, and some people are saying Merlin gave up. John Dunn responding to uh, the host and panelists says, uh, all I can say is not Franklin's. Uh, likely not a herring, but easily could be a California or ring build. And some people are saying, uh, you know, Franklin's was just a guess. Merlin in Idaho apparently uh, called this a starling. Of course, anything could be a starling, right?
and BirdNet in California calls it a great tailed grackle. So uh, one of the things about, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with BirdNet per se, but one of the things about Merlin that the Merlin team will tell you right away is that Merlin has only been trained, Merlin Sky, Sky, uh, Sound ID has only been trained on about 450 species. I don't think they've really gotten into the gulls yet. Uh, and these are some of the birds that people don't usually want to identify by sound. But actually, sound can be a really useful character in identifying gulls. So first off, let's, let's just rule out Franklin's gull. Just like John said, if you know what Franklin's gull sounds like, it sounds significantly different from those other three birds on this list. It's in a different genus now, and there's a good reason for that. Um, because Franklin's gull is quite a different type of bird and has quite a different voice. Uh, much more nasal la laughing and Franklin's gulls are much more nasal than the other birds uh, in this list. So what we're hearing here is the long call of this gull. Uh, this is where the gull usually does some kind of display posture where it bows its head, tosses its head back, gives a kind of a long, fairly stereotyped call. Uh, here's an example of the long call of Franklin's gull. As you'll note, that has a very clear quality to it, whereas our bird is much uh, more hoarse and harsh, uh, and it's got a more nasal uh, call to it. Here's another example of the long call of Franklin. <laughs> Notice that pattern there when you get the nice uh, pop, 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 right at the end of Franklin's goal. Uh, it's a very distinctive pattern with long notes followed by short notes. No other gull in North America does that. Uh, and the, the, the tone quality of Franklin's gull, once you learn it, is very distinctive. They always have this kind of clear, nasal, high-pitched uh, sound that's unlike our target bird. I will, I will play our, our mystery bird again real quick. Now this is a typical long call of this species. And right there, that, that, that says a lot. Uh, let's go to herring gull real quick, just for comparison's sake. Herring gull is kind of your default large gull in most parts of the United States. You hear that kind of yelping series at the end right there? These, the, the, the final notes of a long call are the ones you want to listen to. After the long squeal where the bird throws its head, it usually will get into this series of notes at the end. And that's the, that's the most distinctive and species specific part of a, of a gull's long call. So the large white-headed gulls, herring, glaucous winged, western, uh, glaucous gull, they all end kind of like this. That's kind of your classic seagull call. Uh, you hear that mostly along the coasts more than you hear it inland. Uh, and that is not what we're hearing from our target bird here, which is much slower, higher pitched and hoarser. Here's our mystery bird again. The fact that we don't have that many notes and that the notes are really slow uh, and hoarse uh, is a really good indicator that we are listening to a ring-billed gull, which is what this mystery bird is. Ring-billed is a little different from the other large white-headed gulls, and it's got this slow quality where it's, it's instead of that eat, 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 at the end, it's uh, it's final notes. It's final notes are almost as slow as its first notes. It almost doesn't speed up most of the time. And it's got this high pitched hoarse quality to it. Unlike those, those kind of clear yelps that you get from the large white headed gulls. Uh, now when I say the large white headed gulls, I'm, I'm saying not California. 
because California is also kind of a weird bird. Uh, and it also, it sounds more like the lesser black backed gull. It's uh, lower pitched and hoarser uh, than most of the other large gulls. You hear that almost quacking sound uh, at the end of the, of the California gull call? That's typical. California gulls can also do something a little bit more like what we heard a little bit more ring build like. Uh, they, can, they can definitely cause some confusion, uh, but this really low pitched, hoarse kind of crack, quacking sound is more typical of a California gull. And note how much faster those final notes are than your typical ring build there. All right, let's go on to quiz bird number four. This is a little bit longer one. This is a 40 second recording. So I'll, I'll play it. And after, I don't know, halfway through it, Jen can pop up the, the quiz, the poll. I'll play that one again. Decide which member of the genus Spinus you think that was, and then uh, tell us why in the chat. And we'll go ahead and close that poll. All right, looks like we're doing a little better in that we haven't split everything evenly four ways. Looks like Lesser Goldfinch is coming in in first place with Lawrence's as a close second. Pine Sisk in a distant third. Very few votes for American Goldfinch. Um, it's interesting here. So yeah, Merlin in Santa Barbara is giving Song Sparrow or Harry Woodpecker. Uh, interesting. Birdnet says lesser goldfinch with Pine Siskin as a second. Lawrence seems to be less vocal than the other three. And some people may be having technical difficulties and are hard, having difficulty hearing this, uh, which I know, I know a few people have been having some connection issues potentially. Um, now, when we're listening to a singing goldfinch, and, and goldfinches have multiple different kinds of songs, uh, all the species in this genus can sing a really long song like the one we just heard, or they can split it up into shorter phrases, uh, or they can kind of give these um, single note songs uh, that where, where it's singing just a single note and then it sings, waits a little bit and sings a different single note and then waits a bit and sings a different single note. We're hearing the long song. And in all of these cases, your best bet 
is to listen for certain key things, especially the flight calls of the species. So in American goldfinch, you hear those uh, uh, potato chip, right? The dee -dee -dee -dee, uh, flight calls, you're listening for those to be interspersed with the songs. You're listening for the, the jit -jit 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 -jit, uh, of lesser goldfinch to be introduced, the tip -tip -tip of Lawrence's, or the, that, that very distinctive of pine siskin. And we did not hear that of pine siskin. We did not hear that doo -doo 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 of American goldfinch. So that's why I think most people settle on Lesser or Lawrence's, which is where you should be settling. Uh, if you're not familiar with the song of Lawrence's goldfinch, um, it's not that it's less vocal than the others. It's, it's mostly that it's less encountered than the others. It's actually quite difficult to distinguish from Lesser goldfinch by song in this long rambling song that they both give. Both species are excellent mimics. American goldfinch rarely mimics. Pine siskin sometimes mimics uh, or imitates, I should say. But Lesser and Lawrence's imitate all the time. And there's lots of different imitations in that recording. Uh, and the really tricky thing is that when you're listening for those distinctive call notes, Lesser and Lawrence's will imitate each other's call notes and American Goldfinch's call notes in their songs. So you really have to listen to a nice long chunk and be sure that you're really hearing uh, the same species just, uh, uh, giving its call notes over and over again. So let's just real quick listen to certain pieces of that sound that I'll zoom in and highlight. Uh, here is one of the key little phrases you should be hearing. Those four notes, and they're just mixed in, I'll play it in context now, they're just mixed in with the rest of the song. So here they are at the beginning of a long phrase. So when you hear, <laughs> I, I see some people saying they're changing their vote to lesser goldfish. When you hear this phrase, that's actually the flight call of lesser goldfinch. A lot of people think that the flight call of lesser goldfinch is something more like a do you like this. That's a distinctive sound, but Lawrence's has somewhat similar sounds in this vocabulary. What you really want to listen for is this jijijijit. And that's actually what we call the flight call of Lesser Goldfinch. Uh, now it can appear in Lawrence's Goldfinch songs, but it's distinctive and uh, continuous in this song. And that's your best bet. Also at the end of the song, we hear a few more of these uh, twee sounds. Lawrence's could sound like that, but that's pretty classic for, for lesser as well. So this is a lesser goldfinch that we've heard here for quiz sound number four. All right, so it seems like some people are not hearing that particular mystery sound when they've been hearing the other ones better. I uh, don't have a really good explanation for that, but we'll press on to quiz number five. We'll see what we can do with this. We'll see if everybody can hear this one all right. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about this sound. I was standing to, next to two very good birders in uh, Colorado a while back. And they were arguing with each other over what they were hearing. And the arguments over what bird could be making this sound um, was ranging across a very wide range of possible candidates, which is why I thought, hey, this might be a good sound to play for a WFO field quiz. So I'm going to play this. It's a very brief recording. 
Uh, if it doesn't come in well, the, it, the bird only vocalizes three times in eight seconds. So it's going to be quick and it's going to be a uh, very brief, three brief sounds. If you can't hear it very well, then let me know in the chat, just out of curiosity. I'll play it again. And if Jen can put up the, the poll for this one. All right, I'll play this one or two more times here. Make your choice and be prepared to explain what your thinking is. And we'll close that poll. I see that BirdNet has no guess. Nobody guessed Anna's hummingbird, probably because I, uh, I let the cat out of the bag that this was recorded in Colorado. <laughs> and it looks like Townsend Solitaire is getting the, the, top, the top votes. Uh, Don in the private chat says, Blue Jay seems too obvious, so it must be a Townsend solitaire. Uh, Lily says, Blue Jay sounds similar to Hawks, and this one sounds different. I will say, Blue Jay is never a bad guess for almost any crazy sound. Uh, if, you, if you are hearing some kind of crazy sound and you are in a place that has Blue Jays, uh, it should always be at least considered. Um, famously, in the old Birds of North America account for Blue Jay. The author wrote that he had been studying Blue Jays for 20 years and every six months he heard a sound from a Blue Jay that he had never heard before. Uh, so I was standing in Jefferson County, Colorado next to some very good birders who were hearing this sound and they were arguing over whether it was a solitaire or whether it was a blue jay or what they were what they were hearing, uh, and I was like, I, I was trying to help them figure out what they were hearing, and I and I kept listening past the sound because I thought they, I thought it was obvious, and then I was like, oh, you're talking about the displaying male mallards that are in the creek right in front of us. <laughs> this is and, and only three people got it right <laughs> on this particular quiz this is the whistle of the displaying male mallard and if you don't know this sound you should learn it uh in this particular case it was a little bit of a of a weird situation because the the ducks in the creek were literally 15 feet away from us but they were behind some bushes so they weren't immediately obvious uh, that they were there and so my, my companions were thinking this was a farther away sound from back in the trees. And I can see why so solitaire makes kind of high pitched eat kind of calls sim somewhat similar to this, but the, the change in pitch and the breath equality are both indicative of mallard. Um, some of you wrote in the chat that you were getting distortion when you were listening to this. And I think some of you probably did, 
But some of you also might have been hearing the actual breathy quality of the Mallard call. Uh, so it sounds a little bit weird, like there's something wrong with the whistle, uh, but that's actually the sound. That's actually the way that it should sound in the recording. I'll play it again here. And often this is just a single note. Here, most of these are double notes. They might be single, they might be double. You'll get multiple displaying male mallards giving this call all at the same time. So you might hear kind of a variety of it. Usually there's gonna be some quacking and some other kind of mallard sounds mixed in uh, with this. But if the males are in a displaying mood, you may not hear that. Or you may be in a situation where you're hearing this sound and not associating it with the ducks that are right in front of you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and Lena asks, can we show the spectrograph of the mallard? Let's see, I believe I can. So here's an example from Pennsylvania. So you'll see that these are very high pitched, clear whistles, often with a little bit of splashing or a little bit of quacking kind of around them. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the mallard. So uh, again, in addition to getting people listening to gulls, I'm trying to get them listening to ducks as well. So uh, we have reached the end of our allotted time tonight. It's getting kind of late where I am here in Colorado. Uh, so we're going to call it a night. I've only gotten through half of the sounds I prepared, but I figured I probably wouldn't get through all 10 tonight. I'll save the others for when we can actually be together in person and do this kind of the old fashioned way, hopefully next year in Reno. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat here. Uh, and do keep using those uh, Merlin sound ID and bird net things like they're going to get better with time and they're going to get better if we teach them how to get better. Uh, but the way to get to teach them to get better is to train ourselves by recording what we hear, uploading what we hear, talking about what we're learning. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, as usual, I got my butt kicked, but so it goes. And I, I think you're right. It'll be great to have uh, have this back in action in Reno next year. And uh, I, I appreciate your uh, efforts very much, and especially the comparison of the different uh, Sound ID apps. And it'll be interesting to do this again in a year and see how much better they are. So um, good night to everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock.